What can the NTSB reports teach us about icing? Hey everyone, Jason Shepard here of M0A.com, and you are listening to the Instrument Pilot Podcast. This week, brought to you by our upcoming event, Aviation Mastery, done even better this year, the Aviation Mastery at Sea. Join myself, my good friend Steve O1 Canivo, my other good friend Ken Heron for an outstanding, amazing week of not only educational experiences, but a chance for the entire family to participate that with the launch of our new in-person this time co-pilot course. So take your non-flying spouse, friend, partner, whatever that may be, um, and get them into not just a pinch hitter course, but get them involved in how they can truly be an asset in the cockpit so you can work as a team in the cockpit. We'll be teaching that to your non-flying co-pilots while you're learning about the latest in flight, Garmin, Avidyne, aviation weather, in-flight emergencies, everything from some of the most passionate people I know in aviation. Aviationmastery.com, and we're setting sail October 26th through the 31st. Today on the Instrument Pilot Podcast, I want to chat more about icing. In this week's video, we talked about icing. I taught you the three types of icing. We have clear ice, mixed ice, we have rime ice. We talked about the ram's horns or those ice horns that form as well. We talked about the dangers of ice, honestly. If you know just the basics about aerodynamics and I explain to you, hey, I'm gonna add a ton of weight to your aircraft and I'm gonna spoil the aerodynamic flow, meaning I'm gonna take away lift. I'm gonna add weight and I'm gonna take away lift. You're gonna say, Jason, that, that's a recipe for disaster. And that's exactly what ice does. Ice spoils the smooth airflow, thus decreasing lift, while adding weight to the aircraft. Ice is a lose-lose situation. I wanna take what we covered in the YouTube video this week, I'll call it the basics, and again, I hope you're, you're following along with these YouTube videos as well, or, or you watch them on Facebook or YouTube, however you consume them. Obviously, we're an entire aviation weather series right now. If you're on the webinars with us uh, as an, an M0A online ground school member, I hope you're partaking in all of this uh, because it's just, it's a way to step up our game when it comes to weather and instrument flying in particular, it is all about the weather. You might think it's all about gorgeous approaches and everything else, but it's all about making good decisions in the weather, which leads me to an NTSB report. An NTSB report from 1975. Uh, let's go ahead and dive into it. At 1644 Eastern Standard Time on January 12th, 1975, a Cessna 411 Alpha. Let me pause there, because if you're like me, you thought, what on earth is a Cessna 411? I thought the exact same thought. So I Googled it. I found out the, um, the 411, there were about 300 made. 50 of this type, the 411 Alpha, and about 250 of the actual 411. You've heard of a 414, you've heard of a 421, you've probably heard of a Cessna 340. It fits in the same twin Cessna realm. However, if you had to picture it, it is a non-pressurized 421 if you had to picture it that way, okay? Um, now, also remember, this is in 1975. This is just about a brand new airplane back in 1975. This is the top-notch technology. This is a, it'd be like flying a 2020, a 2021 SR-22 right now, right? I'm talking decked out technology-wise, the latest and greatest for this time. The tail number was 100 Kilo Charlie and it departed Savannah Municipal Airport, Savannah, Georgia on an IFR flight plan to Pontiac, Michigan. The pilot was a dentist and accompanied by his wife and family. They were returning home from vacation. Eight minutes after takeoff, the pilot of 100 Kilo Charlie declared an emergency and requested immediate radar vectors back to Savannah. The pilot explained he had a fluctuation on our right engine, is what he told ATC. Then, at 1700, the pilot reported, everything seemed fine. Let's get back to climbing. It's one thing to declare an emergency and then say, you know what, I think everything's fine now, let's keep going. This is the first in, um, uh, 
and I, I guess I can see this. I can see maybe you, you left the engine too lean and you're like, oh, duh, I, I've done that before. I've been at high altitude, came down to a descent, went to get a little more power. The power wasn't there, panicked for a second, realized, oh, you know what? I never enriched the mixture for my descent or um, had a carburetor heat issue or whatever. And, and it was just pilot induced. It was my fault. And I resolved now I didn't declare an emergency and then take it away. But trust me, I panicked for half a second and then realized, oh, wait, this is my own doing. So maybe that's the case. But to, to go back on declaring an emergency, um, I don't know the ATC rules and regulations on that, but it, it, it brings that into question most certainly. So everything seems fine. Let's start climbing. So the Savannah controller cleared the flight to maintain 7,000 feet and vectored the flight to Victor Airway 185. The pilot was uh, cleared subsequently to climb to 11,000 feet on Victor 185, where he was to resume his own navigation. At 1717, so this is 17 minutes later, uh, since this declaring of an emergency, the pilot requested uh, Jack's approach to provide him with weather information along the route. He was advised of a line of thunderstorms ahead, but was told that a deviation to the west of course would keep the flight out of the heavy stuff. This is the Jack's controller talking. The pilot was advised that the pilot of an MU-2 reported light rime icing and moderate turbulence at 17,000 feet. At the time, the pilot advised the controller that he had weather radar aboard the aircraft. The controller then cleared the flight to deviate as necessary around precip areas. So let me stop there. And I'm sorry for stopping and taking so many detours because this is a long NTSB report to read through, but it's important. Flight into known icing. Flight into known icing is prohibited unless we're approved for it. The moment there is an airmat or a, a pie wrap or whatever it may be for icing, there's a report of icing, there is known icing. When this MU-2 pilot reported light rime icing at 17,000 feet, it now became known that there is icing in the area at 17,000 feet. We'll learn more about what this aircraft was equipped with in just a bit here to see if we're even certified for flight into known icing here. At 1728, the pilot reported he was at 11,000 feet. The flight was requested to change frequencies and after some repeated transmissions by the controller and the pilot, communication was established on the new frequency. At 1742, 42 minutes after this emergency now, after communication was established on the new frequency, the flight was then handed off to Atlanta so the Atlantic controller could assist the pilot in avoiding some weather. At 1743, the Atlantic controller cleared the flight to proceed direct to the Anderson VOR via radar vectors to the Sugarloaf VOR, then is filed. At 1746, the flight was requested to change frequencies again. Again, communication established on the new frequency. The pilot was informed by the controller. I'm sorry, the pilot informed the controller that he had weather radar and he was in VFR. He was going to use radar and, you know, I'll need your help too, his words. So I have radar, but you know, I'm going to need your help too. This is the pilot speaking to the controller. At 1758, the controller provided the pilot with a radar vector, which will take you through the lightest part I'm showing, says the controller. The vector was accepted by the pilot. At 1804, the controller issued a vector of 340, which was accepted, and the controller cleared the flight to intercept Victor 222 to the Sugarloaf VOR, then continue as filed. At 1807, an hour and seven minutes since the emergency that was declared and taken back, the pilot reported he was not receiving the Sugarloaf VOR. The aircraft's position relative to Victor 222 airway was given by the controller. At 1817, after changing frequencies again, the flight was cleared direct to Sugarloaf. Now, you're clear of everything I'm painting, said the controller. Uh, that's just a, a shorthand phrase of saying, I'm, I'm painting on the weather radar, right? They're painting green. So you're clear of everything I'm painting. You're clear of everything I'm showing on my radar, is what the controller was saying. Shortly after, at 1827, the pilot requested the controller check the weather at Willow Run at Detroit, Michigan. The pilot stated he could not get anybody about weather there. The weather at Willow Run was not available, but the controller gave the pilot the Detroit Metropolitan Airport weather. So he's quite a ways out and already concerned about the weather at Willow Run, um, just an airport along the way. He was heading to Pontiac, Michigan. So we'll see. 
1836, the controller advised the pilot that there were some isolated cells in the vicinity of Holston Mountain VOR, just ahead of the flight, and other cells over Whitesburg VOR, northwest of the flight. At the pilot's request, the controller cleared the flight to deviate to avoid the weather and agreed to give you vectors from the weather I'm painting, though I'm not painting all the weather, says the controller. And this goes back to you know, advice I've given in the past. Now, ATC radar has come a long way since 1975, but there was a time when, you had to remember, this radar was developed to spot airplanes, not spot weather. It would spot some precipitation if it was intense enough, but like the controller said here, I'm not painted. I don't show all the weather. At 1839, the pilot reported that I'm new with radar here, said the pilot, and after discussing what he saw in his radar, he asked if a 15 degree deviation to the left would help keep him out of the weather. After further discussion between the pilot and the controller, the pilot accepted the vector to get you through the narrowest part of it right now. About one minute later, in response to the question from the controller, the pilot reported he was in heavy rain. At 1846, the pilot requested vectors to Victor 53. He was advised that he was about four miles left of Victor 53, and the flight was cleared direct to Whitesburg VOR and given a vector toward the station. At 1851, in response to a question from the controller, the pilot reported the ride is great and that he was navigating onto Whitesburg now. Next, the pilot requested a report on the cloud tops in the area and was advised that the tops were at 14,500 to 15,000 feet. At 1857, the control of the flight was transferred to Indianapolis. At 1904, the pilot re reported to the controller, 100 Kilo Charlie is starting to pick up some ice at 11,000 feet, sir. Any report on where we can get out of this? He was advised that he could either climb or descend at his discretion. At 19.04 and 35 seconds, the pilot said that he was leaving 11,000 feet and climbing to 15,000 feet. At 19.04, 40 seconds, he was cleared to maintain 15,000 feet. And just a few seconds later here, the pilot reported, 100 Kilo Charlie having a problem engine here, sir. At 19.05 and 55 seconds, the response to the question from the controller regarded the request to descend. The pilot said negative. So the controller said, well, you got an engine problem. Would you like to descend? Negative, said the pilot. The pilot said he would stay at his altitude and then try to climb again. So I'm having an engine problem, but I'm going to try to climb again while I'm picking up ice. Are we putting anything together here? Let's see. Let's continue on, though. The controller acknowledged that the transmission at 1906 and asked the pilot to keep him advised of the situation. Ten seconds later, the pilot reported 100 Kilo Charlie's got a big problem. Pilot's words. The pilot asked the controller to keep me on radar vectors on my course while I fiddle with my engine. At 1907, the pilot stated, better stay at 11 here, sir, and the controller cleared, him to, uh, cleared the flight to maintain 11,000 feet. Next, the pilot requested vectors back to the course and was given a heading of 360 and advised he would be about three miles east of the airway where he was put on the airway and given a vector of 350. In 1911, the pilot reported 100 Kilo, Kilo Charlie, extreme vibration again, sir. The controller requested the pilot repeat his call and the pilot said again, uh, Kilo Charlie has got an extreme vibration again and you'd better lead me to an airport. At 1911, the controller replied that there was an airport at Whitesburg and another about 30 degrees to the right of the aircraft's heading at 15 miles. The pilot replied, lead me somewhere. Can I get there without an approach or what? The controller responded that he would have to check and see what was best. He also advised the pilot that they have a lot of snow reported on the ground at these two airports. While the controller was waiting for a report on airport conditions, um, Paintsville Prestonburg Combs, or just we'll call it Combs from now, such a long name, advised the pilot at 1912 that, for your information, the closest airport with an instant approach is at your, make it five o'clock position, 150, arrive the aircraft heading about two one miles. At 1912, the pilot asked uh, what the st what state this latter airport was in and requested the name of the airport. You know you're in a long cross country, you have to ask which state the airport's in. The controller advised the pilot that Lonesome Pines is in Virginia. Now, why did he ask what state? Again, my longtime pilots will know this, but how did our how were our approach plates originally arranged? If you had like a Jeppesen binder or something, well, they're arranged by 
state is how you'd actually go through. Um, and even in the, the NOS books as well, you would go through by state to pull up these airports. About 25 seconds later, the pilot again asked the name of the airport and was given the name of the airport and the frequency. The pilot reported he was having now difficulties hearing the controller, but after several transmissions, he heard and read it back correctly. Um, later, we, uh, we learned the difficulty in hearing the controller was because of ice on the antennas. Now, I want to bring up a point here. If you get to the point where you're now picking up ice on the antennas, it's not one of the last places to pick up ice, but it's such a small surface. An antenna is that it's difficult to pick up ice on an antenna. You pick up ice on the wings and the spars and, and the gear. If you have gear, like picture a, a Cessna Grand Caravan. Those are ice machines. There's so many you know uh, big control surfaces out there, big surfaces out there. When you start picking up ice on the antennas, you're in more of a predicament than you'd like to lead on here. At 1913, the controller gave the pilot a vector to Lonesome Pine Airport. When the pilot acknowledged the vector, he again requested the name of the airport. So we can play it out. He said again, I don't know if it's an issue hearing, but they're going back and forth, back and forth. I need the name of this airport. At 1914 and 45 seconds, the pilot transmitted, I'm losing altitude. And he was asked to repeat his transmission now. In 1915, he asked for the name of the city associated with the airport. After several transmissions and after the name Wise, Virginia, was literally spelled out, the pilot reported in 1915 and 20 seconds that he had the plate and he's at 10,000 feet. But it's very difficult to hold altitude. Why do you believe it's very difficult to hold altitude? Can you, can you imagine? What haven't we shared here yet? The the light ice we were picking up is now getting into the moderate to heavy to possibly extreme conditions. The pilot then initiated a series of radio calls to attempt to contact the controller, but the controller's replies apparently were not received by the pilot. So the pilot requested another frequency. The controller did not respond. It wasn't out of missing it. He simply just could not hear the transmission. The controllers at Indianapolis requested the Tri-City Tennessee Airport weather from Atlanta Center, and they received that at 1917. The pilot then asked for the Lonesome Pine weather. The controller advised the nearest station I can get weather for is the Tri-City Airport. It's about 30 miles due south of the Lonesome Pine Airport. There the weather is measured at uh, 1 6,000 broken, correction, 1,600 broken, 4,000 overcast, 7 miles in light rain. If it's raining down at the surface and we're talking winter time, it's probably freezing up above that. The pilot responded 100 Kilo Charlie is going down, sir. The controller acknowledged the call and issued an altimeter setting of 29 or 9 or 4. Five seconds later, the pilot announced a heading of 160 and was advised by the controller that it looks pretty good for the airport right now. The pilot asked, did you tell Kilo Charlie to go down to 6,000? Although the controller had not previously issued a clearance to maintain a specific altitude, he replied, Roger, just maintain 6,000. Just thankful he could actually get down to something, perhaps. The pilot then transmitted 100 Kilo Charlie is going down. Once again, he said. The controller acknowledged there were several communications regarding headings and distance to the airport. At 1920, the pilot acknowledged he was receiving the Lonesome Pine VOR. The pilot then acknowledged as passing through 8,000 feet and requested a radio check. Again, it was so difficult to hear each other. The pilot responded that the controller's transmission was breaking up. 11 miles out from the airport, the pilot reported he was at 6,800 feet, and the controller was able to acknowledge it. However, when the pilot asked for the winds, the controller replied to him, simply say again, whereupon the pilot said, what runway would I use there? He was told to use runway 24. The pilot had difficulty hearing that response and asked the controller to be able to hear the transmission when the aircraft went below 6,000 feet. He was advised that the remote transmitter site was about 15 miles southwest of Lonesome Pine. At 1924, the pilot asked whether he should go lower after he reached 6,000 feet. He was advised that when he reached 6,000 feet, the flight was cleared for an approach to Lonesome Pine to cruise at 6,000 feet. The pilot was able to hear this and acknowledge this transmission here. He was then told that he was cleared for the procedure turn and the approach. The clearance was acknowledged while the flight was inbound to the airport. The controller advised the pilot the flight was 6 miles and 3.3 miles from the airport. At 1927, the controller asked if the pilot had ground contact. 
The pilot stated he did not. He repeated the statement at 1928 when he was reported at 6,000 feet. Five seconds later, he asked if he could go below 6,000 feet and was advised that he could start his descent. In reply, he asked if he could descend to 4,600. He was advised that at 4,600, he had a satisfactory altitude for the procedure turn. The controller's team determined that the runway lights were on at Lonesome Pine and the runway and identifier lights could be activated by radio command. At 1929, the pilot reported 5,200 feet, but still didn't have the ground in contact here. The controller advised they should be at 4,600 until inbound on the procedure turn. The pilot requested the transmission be repeated, and it goes back and forth where they just can't help here. I repeat, he said, the pilot stated he would like to go up a little bit. Communication was then established again at 1933. Tell me when I can go down to six, so will ya? Kind of stuttering there. The field elevation at Lonesome Pine was 2,680 feet. The pilot again experienced more difficulties hearing the controller. The operator at the Lonesome Pine Airport was at his home when he heard a twin-engine aircraft make a missed approach about 10 minutes later. He believed to hear the same aircraft again making another missed approach. He stated that the weather at the airport was, in his opinion, an estimated 200 feet overcast, visibility of one mile with freezing rain. He reported that the ground and trees were covered with clear ice about a quarter inch thick. So here's this pilot that obviously we lost radio contact with because of ice on the antennas, ended up having to make a missed approach. The airport manager, airport operator heard it, came back around somehow for another missed approach. At 1937, the pilot is trying to establish radio communication again and request assistance to get flight to another airport, and the controller responded with a vector towards the Tri-City Airport, Bristol, Tennessee, about 25 miles south of Wise, Virginia. The pilot indicated that he was starting to climb, and he was cleared to a right turn of 180 to climb and maintain 6,000 feet. The pilot reaffirmed the assigned heading of 180 and asked if there was an ILS at Tri-City. He was told there was an ILS and a radar approach control there. At 1939, we've been flying a while now, two and a half, a little over two and a half hours. The pilot reported his altitude was 3,300 feet, and he was instructed to climb and maintain 6,000 feet. We're trying to climb, sir, he said. After being informed the weather at Tri-City, the pilot said, 100 kilo, kilo Charlie, get me there. Asking the controller again, please help me, get me there. At 1940, in his response to request for an, uh, his altitude, the pilot reported he was at 3,000 feet and unable to climb here. In response to one pilot's question, the pilot asked, can you make it at three? At 1941, the time, the controller advised, 100 kilo Charlie, maintain your altitude. At that time, the flight was traversing terrain that it was about 3,000 feet. Big Stone Mountain was an elevation of 4,223 feet and was located about six miles off the right wingtip here. At 1943, communication went back and forth and finally reestablished between the pilot and the controller. The pilot acknowledged an instruction to turn left to a head of 360. The course was reversed about five miles north of the Clinch Mountain Ridge. At 1944, the pilot reported, getting there 360, sir. He again stated that his altitude was 3,000 feet and he could not climb any higher. Having resolved any immediate problems, the controller personnel coordinated over the next two minutes and decided that the flight should be turned to a heading of 240 to take the flight down a valley between mountain ridges and vector the pilot around the end of the mountain ridge just north of Tri-City. The pilot could then approach the airport from the northwest. However, the planned course of action could not immediately be taken because at 1945, radio communications with the pilot were once again lost on a heading of 360. The controller could hear the pilot calling, but the pilot could not hear the controller's, um, the controller's transmissions here. Radio communication with the pilot was then reestablished at 1948, and it was cleared to a heading of 240, which the pilot was able to acknowledge. According to Indianapolis Center, an Indianapolis Center controller, the aircraft's radar position at the time was 10 miles southeast of the Lonesome Pine VOR, I'm sorry, Lonesome Pine Airport. The flight turned to a heading of 240, and the controller's observations indicated the aircraft track would pass south of Stone Mountain and subsequently over the valley where it would be vectored to the Tri-City Airport as previously planned.
Although radio communications had been regained, the pilot had difficulty understanding or hearing the controller. In reply to this question, the pilot was again informed that he was being vectored to the Tri-City Airport. The pilot questioned the controller about distances from the airport and apparently did not receive any answers. At 1950, the last transmission from the pilot was 100 Kilo Charlie. Do you read me, sir? Do you read me? A number of ground witnesses indicated they heard a low-flying aircraft in areas where 100 Kilo Charlie was operating. They indicated they heard the aircraft pass overhead, but the clouds were 100 to 200 feet above the ground and visibility was one mile or less in freezing rain. A witness about one mile northeast of the accident site saw the aircraft's lights pass overhead about 100 feet above the ground. He said that the engines sounded normal. And then it gets on to where the accident actually occurred in Wise, Virginia. And you read this, and I left some things out on purpose. Again, it's a very long and lengthy uh, full NTSB report. This aircraft was equipped for flight into known icing. It had boots. It had every little thing that it needed to get out of the situation. It had the latest and greatest weather radar that you heard the pilot say, I'm just not quite familiar with here. We had, at the time, for 1975 technology, we had the best technology, we had what we needed, but we didn't have the ability to actually use it. And this was a fairly high time pilot, but low time in this particular aircraft. This was certainly a new to him aircraft. And I share this with you. You know, beyond, I, I can teach you the types of icing and where icing's likely to occur and everything else over and over again. However, the point I really want to hit home, and I feel like I share this almost every, every podcast for sure, is that you can have the latest and greatest in technology. But if you don't know how to use it, if you're not taking the time to use that, to get up with that CFI who knows everything. If you're buying a new Cirrus, you should be going to Cirrus school or flying with a CSIP or whatever it is, right? Learning and, and taking in any information you can about that aircraft, learning its systems forwards and backwards. You paid for all these features. You might as well know how to utilize them fully as well. And that's what this accident of 100 Kilo Charlie uh, really illustrates here. And again, I hate talking about fatalities uh, when it comes to accidents, but it's uh, we'd be doing these pilots a disservice by not actually learning from them. So a little bit of a longer uh, NTSB report leading to a longer instrument pilot podcast. I hope you really enjoyed it. I hope you're also taking time to listen to the private pilot podcast, the commercial pilot podcast, and of course, the CFI podcast as well. I hope you will be joining us on the Aviation Mastery at Sea adventure, aviationmastery.com to check that out and learn more. Setting sail October 26th through the 31st. Join myself, Steve Owen Canivo, my good friend Ken Heron. You're not going to want to miss this event, especially bring the non-flying friends, spouses, partners, whatever it may be as well. This is a family event, no doubt. So thank you so much for your reviews on all our podcasts as well and just your loyalty. Uh, you make this m Nation, this m family, uh, the outstanding entity that it is. We truly couldn't do it without you. So on behalf of myself and the entire m team, if there is anything at all we can do this week to help make you that safer, smarter pilot, please, please, please. Don't hesitate to reach out. Enjoy the rest of your day. And most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, guys. We'll see you. Take a two-week free trial of our online ground school and see why Aviation Consumer Magazine named it the top online ground school on the market. The first thing you'll notice is that we never teach to the test. We teach real world skills that are gonna keep you and your loved ones safe when you fly. Now it's because of this real world teaching, you'll pass your knowledge test and your check ride with flying colors. With one membership, you get access to all our courses, plus weekly webinars with myself and this outstanding M0A.com team. It's really like an interactive TV show broadcast from our studio where you get to interact with a team of CFIs. We also offer live support and email support to make sure you succeed. 
Now, one thing you'll notice is that M0A is like nothing else on the market. It is truly a flight training community geared towards making you a safer, smarter pilot because a good pilot is always learning. It's much more than a slogan for us. It is truly a mission. So click below and take a two week, no strings attached trial of our top rated private instrument, commercial and FOI courses. Once you join our flight train community, I promise you will never want to leave.